Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hammer Podcast. Today is March 26, 2024, and I'm speaking with Grace. Grace went to the Family Foundation School from January 1999 to September of 2000. What a way to start the new millennium, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, I was I was there on the New Year's, um, yeah, the New Year's Eve. I remember that, that we were all hoping that um, the world was going to blow up and we wouldn't be there anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can only hope, right? So, yeah. go, go ahead and uh, tell us uh, why you went there and uh, the experience okay. that you had there. So, to this day, like, I still don't know why I was sent there. I know that sounds really weird. I mean, I, I kind of know why my stepmother put me there. But um, at first, I want to just make it clear that I'm, I was not, I was not in trouble at home. Um, I was actually, like, the complete opposite of a kid that should have put, been put there. Actually, I mean, I don't think any anyone should have gone there. None of them deserved um what they endured but um like i had never done drugs i had um i mean i think i'd have like one glass of wine when i went to paris when i was 13 with my grandmother but Uh it was you know part of the culture i mean they eventually they used that against me there but i had never um like i had decent grades i think i was doing pretty bad in a couple of classes at school but i i had pretty good friends um I was involved in like musical theater, band, chorus. I was on a soccer team. Um, I mean, I was going to like Bible clubs and just kind of um, like an, a, nor- a normal teenager. And what happened was, um, I'm going to have to des- describe what my life was like before the school. So I had a very, very good mother who, um, I, I lived with her after my, my parents' divorce. I'd like visit my dad, but I was mainly with my mom and my stepdad. And um, I could not have asked for a better, more or organic childhood. Uh, both of them were touring musicians. My mother was also um, worked in the medical field, but she was also a professional musician. Uh, my stepdad was the big time um, touring jazz musician. He still is. He'd worked with the Dave Matthews Band and um, a variety of very well-known, famous artists. Um, so we were always at music festivals. They were always playing. They would regularly host music events at the house. And the, man, even from like a young age, I remember like hosting my own music events at the house. Like I'd um, make a list if I wanted to come over and come over and play. Like for all my birthday parties, I would have a music themed birthday party where I'd actually be like inviting my mom's friends over to like play music like I like wanted adults there even Mm -hmm. even from like the age of like eight and then I had my friends over and we'd have like little talent shows like we were just it was just such a magical like holistic upbringing we had like a garden we'd grow our food um I would spend like summers at my mother's parents farm um camping out and I could not have asked for a better mother It, it was just um devastating to lose her. What happened was she got melanoma, which is one of the most deadly forms of skin cancer, and it progressed so fast. So when I hit middle school, like, she was gone. Like, it, it um, they, they had given her literally six months to live. But um, to talk about how big a deal she was, um, was Mike Seeger, who is the brother of the famous folk musician, Pete Seeger, she, he, uh, yes. he even, like, came to her funeral and talked like that but so I ended up going to live with um the courts wanted me to go full-time with my biological dad and that's when the issue started um mainly because I did not get along with his wife and my dad also had had my dad had a variety of mental instabilities I I don't want to use this as a platform to talk about my rocky relationship with my dad because he has since passed away and I do love him dearly but he was not um mentally stable a good amount of the time and he had um this woman that he kind of turned custody over to her not like officially legally but she like was like my guardian and she was just like the complete opposite of my mom and had grown up in um 
a very, very strict religious community, actually Mennonite. Oh, really? And she just had a okay. completely different view view of how a parent and a child will relate to each other. And keep in mind, I'm like moving into my teen years. I was already like, I never had an official diagnosis, but I will say I was like very, very depressed, but I felt like that was a normal, looking back, that's like a normal reaction to um, losing your mother, losing your best friend, and then being taken out of that world. Like my stepmom didn't want me over there with my mom's people and like my old friends. And um, she didn't want me to go see my stepdad and my maternal grandmother too often. I, mean, I still got to see them, but she put a lot of restrictions on it. And um, the main thing we would argue over was the way I dressed. I just, I guess I dressed like a hippie and also I was really into like the skater clothing look. That was, you know, late nineties. Um, I liked Nirvana a lot. I like, I, I really liked grunge music. Um, and she just came from an environment, I guess, where people didn't do things like that. And I will say how um, she found the family school was her ex-husband her ex-husband's niece was um, rebelling. She was a Mennonite. They were like very strict Mennonites. And her parents had sent her to the school. And I guess my stepmom was like venting to them about me. Okay. And they're like, oh, well, we know this great place in up upstate New York. Now, we're, we're in Virginia. I'm just letting, trying to explain the proximity. Okay. But they're like, oh, we sent, I'm not going to say her name, but we sent so-and-so up there. And, oh, she loves it. It's so wonderful. And da 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 and um, my son was like, oh, yeah, because I really think Grace is going to kill herself and is into drugs. Like, she was just naming all this all this stuff. And I think at one point when I was with her, I, I told her, man, you really make me want to kill myself. Or, like, I was on the phone with a friend. I said, this woman makes me want to jump in front of a train. I would be very, I've always been very blunt and graphic with my words. And she just goes, oh, that's, that's what Grace is going to do. And plus. She had her master's degree in psychiatric nursing. So she was already just so privy to everyone needs a diagnosis. Like she, she should have gone and worked at the family school. <laughs> I think she works in a jail now. She works in a jail for like helping people get outpatient treatment rather than they finish their sentence outside of being incarcerated. They'll go to a halfway house. And halfway actually, house. I really respect her. I respect her career. There's many things that I actually, we, we've gotten together and talked about all of this is and um, i don't i don't want to bash her i don't i don't want her name out in public i don't want i don't even want her to lose her job in her field but she just loves to diagnose people and in her mind you're just a criminal or if you smoke weed that means you're going to do crack and i think she's gotten a little bit more open-minded over right. the years um and well, everything so moving on so oh sorry i'm sorry i'm just <laughs> ranting they, they, I, uh, they, they've I'm sorry. They've always called marijuana the gateway drug, all the time. You know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And like, so I, and I've never even tried. I had never tried mar marijuana. Um, at least I, I like wore a hemp. I had a hemp necklace I liked to to wear at the time, and um, and everything. But anyway, so I was like giving. I was like ribbing to man. I I would tell her, man, she's she's crazy and then i mean i was my dad it was so i always sometimes felt like i was the one taking care of my dad i mean he always worked it's never like he wasn't taking care of his business but mentally like he was very fragile and i ended up taking on a large adult role of like listening to his problems all the time from a young age from after my mom died where i was like his emotional support system which probably wasn't healthy and sometimes I'd call him out on that stuff and then he'd get mad and he was the type of person that needed like a lot of personal space and then my stepmom was the type who just wants to hang over everyone's head and, and nag them nag them literally to death so he'd snap he snapped on her he'd snap on her and be screaming at her she's like oh I'm calling the police like so then, then the police would come over and, he, and I'm like no he's just having a nervous breakdown he's not, he's never going to beat me one up and he just needs to like he was a big hiker like he'd go backpacking a lot I said he just he just needs to go on one of his trips so again he, he would be kind of absent and in, in and out so that's why my stepmom was literally managing my life but anyway I remember I couldn't take it anymore being in that house I was 16 years old I had no idea that she was already plotting the family school that I was already going 
<laughs> to get sent away. But I remember Christmas break. I was in 10th grade, it was Christmas break. And I called my maternal grandmother and I said, can you please just come pick me up? And she's like, okay. Now, my stepmother tried to press the kidnapping charges on this. 80, this woman was like 80 years old, you know. I went to her house and I stayed there for two weeks and my dad and stepmom never bothered me. I was like, well, maybe they're just going to like leave me alone. And then school started, the semester started. I went back to high school on like my own accord. You know, I wanted to be in school. And then I was just sitting there in Spanish class and here comes the guidance counselor. She's like, we need to have great, we need grace in the office. And it was like so serious and so weird. And I went into this tiny room there was a police officer in the room and my stepmom and they shut the door and they're like, you can't leave. And then the, the, they set, sent someone down with my backpack. And then my stepmom's like, we're going on um, a retreat. We're going on a family healing retreat, like a therapy weekend. Cause I want the family to be back together. We got in the car, um, started the eight hour drive to uh, Hancock, New York. And I, I just remember, falling asleep instantly just passing out and later i have found out that these schools encourage the parents to get them the kid there by any means necessary including drugging them now keep in mind my stepmother worked at a psychiatric hospital to this day i think i can't prove it so i don't it's not something i want to talk too much about but i right. i think she put something in my food or water i passed out woke up in new york um we went into a restaurant and I remember I was like, okay, I have to go to the bathroom. She followed me into the bathroom, watched me go to the bathroom. And I was like, this woman thinks I'm going to run away. We go to the hotel. There's two beds. She doesn't want to lay next to my bed. She like lays in bed with me all night, like wrapped around me. Like I said, this is weird. If I went to the car to get something, she followed me. Um, I said, can I call my grandmother? Because my grandmother was supposed to meet, pick me up from track practice. And she's like, no, don't call your grandmother. She doesn't need to know. And, and then I said, well, how long are we going to be at this retreat? Because, you know, um, I have a band concert. I played clarinet in the band, and I actually was scheduled to receive an award. Um, I had some honorary thing I'd been accepted into. What'd and you, she's like, oh, you don't need to worry about, worry about that, huh? What would you play? What was your instrument? Cla oh, the clarinet. Okay. The, cl clarinet. the clarinet. And so I was supposed to get an award and she's like, oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure you get to it, but don't worry about that. I said, well, it's next week. I don't want to miss it. And I, of course I missed it because I went to the family school. Um, and then the next day we went, went to the family school. There's snow everywhere. It was January. And I said, oh, like, what's this? And she said, oh, we're going skiing. I mean, it was kind of flat for skiing, but she knew my dad and I were big skiers. She said, we're going skiing. I said, well, I thought we were going on a family retreat. Like, the story keeps changing. And um, then we go in, and she and my dad just leave. And I'm sitting in a room, and here comes this lady. Um, her initials are MM. Everyone's going to know I'm talking about. She ended up being my family leader, and she came in. And then she had two other girls with her that were around my age, and they sat down. And they said, your family is gone. You were going to be here from 18 to 21 months. And this is like a drug. I can't remember the specific words. This is a drug treatment program. And I just burst into tears and they brought in my bag. And then all the girls, the two girls are checking my bags to make sure they're like, they started taking out all my tie dyed shirts and hemp necklaces and any shirts that had a band and had a green day shirt. All of that was taken away. Oh man. And they're like, it's all negative. It's all negative. And um, I just remember specifically them saying something about the drug treatment. I said, I've never tried a drug in my life. And um, they're like, no, you're lying. You're in denial. And you can't leave here. And then I remember being taken to this room where they made you take an academic assessment to see what classes you would be in. And I remember answering all the wrong answers on purpose because I thought, I want them to think I'm too stupid to be here. And um, and then they brought you. Um, I know they, yeah, they told me and like they told they told you about how the school was divided up into families. By the time I was there, it was six families, th about thirty kids of each family, maybe between eight and ten staff, and then two of the staff would be considered the parents, and often they were well, like in mine, M M, -M and her husband 
And it, so they were married and they were considered our mom and dad. Okay. And they take me right back down to that family. I'm crying my eyes out. And they make me stand in front of all these people I don't know. And they're like, um, you're here, something about you're here because you're a pain in the ass, your family. And I said, I've never done drugs. They're like, you're a liar. And then they just all started calling me an alcoholic. And then I remember I sat in the chair because they were all eating. And I like went under the table. Like I just like slid down so low and then just, like went and sat under the table. And then they brought out some chicken and I said I'm a vegetarian and they're like okay you have 24 hours to not eat meat but after that you're, you have to eat meat every day and you have to eat whatever is on the table and no I remember they did a, before all this they did a strip search you had to stay in the shower they checked you for life they checked your privates for drugs and knives and all sorts all sorts of things and um and I just remember them like there was like no look in their eyes we looked at them while they did all this both the staff and the kids it just didn't look like a soul was there like just all personality was gone and then you, you just realize that you're like completely surrounded by people that are not in reality right. is what i i um uh, and then they my found out literally within a couple of weeks of being there they said oh your grandmother's been contacting attorneys to try to get you out of here and your stepmother wants to her, you to write her a letter and tell her that you love the place. And um, they were very threatening about it. And I was like, well, oh, my God, my stepmom hates my grandma. So I wrote, I wrote my grandmother the letter and told her to stop. But that's how terrified. By then, I was just so terrified of these people because literally the day I got there, we had to go into the gym. I already know you know what the table topics are, but this was called a house topic. And a house topic was when all the six families and, like, every staff come together, usually in the gym, and they, all, they scream at the entire school about something. And I, one of these particular cases, a kid had drawn, like, a Nazi symbol <laughs> on a table. And they wanted someone to admit to it. And then they said, okay, we'll cut all your food for you. Everyone's going to get half portion of food until they admit it. Or, or one time, they said, everyone gets go to their dorm, get their toothbrush, and then we, you were there to like 2 a.m. scrubbing the gym with your toothbrush, and you couldn't get a new toothbrush till the new supplies came in in a few days. But with this particular, they had a health topic that my very first day, and I just, I don't remember what this specific one was about, but I just remember just in the gym, and the staff, there was this guy, staff, his name was um, M.L., his initials, and he would just scream and scream and scream. And I just remember standing there, like crying my eyes out. But I realized, like, I was terrified of these people. So all that led up to when I wrote my grandmother the letter and um, told her I wanted to stay, which is so, like, out of character for me. For how used to I was for just standing up for myself and being kind of, like, um, opinionated. You know, which is one thing my stepmom didn't like about me. But, um, right. yeah, sorry, that's kind of like the in introduction to my, this, how I ended up there and everything. Was this the same year that uh, they had the, uh, where they would wrap people up in blankets and duct tape them? Um, now, I think I remember a kid now, there's Family One. I know Emil told you about Family One, which that was probably the roughest family to be in. I vaguely remember, I think that might have been coming to an end. I'm trying, see, I had to, um, I've been sitting here all day, like, writing notes, like, trying to recharge all the details of my memory. Uh -huh. I, I know that kids would be put on the floor with multiple staff and students, sometimes up to, like, eight, all sitting on them at the one time, and I don't think... I saw duct tape or blankets, but I know that it'd be like ground and pound and um, everyone just like dog piling someone. And I did see a kid get picked up by the father of, um, you know, my family leader, the, the guy we called dad. He picked up a kid and threw, I watched him thrown through the wall in a hole. Like it was like a, I guess, I think the walls already had a lot of issues and were poorly made, but he did like it. It was like a full hole in the wall. He, he got thrown really hard. And the kids would get dragged, too. Like, if you, if you didn't want to go wherever they told you to go, like, they'd have multiple people just dragging you around 
and I did go force fed regularly. She was supposedly had an eating disorder and she was refusing to eat. and I would I watched multiple people on multiple days like force the food into her mouth. But right. I don't. I'm. I just don't think I witnessed duct tape and blankets. Well, I, mean, I, want, I want to be like as transparent as possible. Right. Emil said that it was basically coming to an end when he was there as well. So yeah, it yeah. may not have been a lot. Two thousand and four. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but the isolation room was isolation room was used daily. Um, oh, okay. When I was there, daily someone was in that in that room. Yeah, the isol isolation room was uh, isolation room was probably more humane. And they didn't want anybody, you know, going to the police or anything about it, because you know they they monitored your 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 phone calls, they 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 read your mail, that kind of stuff. Yes, everything, every move you make was scrutinized. Even going to the bathroom, they would watch you, because um, of eating disorders. Um. You know, you always had to, like, have your toilet checked. Even if the stall was shut, it, before you flushed, you had to have... I think maybe that only rule applied to the eating disorder. Yeah, I think if you had an eating mm -hmm. disorder, you were required to have the toilet looked at before you flushed. Right. But I remember someone had to be in the bathroom. And I remember um, the phone calls were monitored for your first, like, two months, I think. And then I remember after that, like, you were given a little bit more mm -hmm. leniency. Unless you were on like shadow or had been in a lot of trouble, I know you already know what sh shadow is. Right. right. Um, but I remember having unsupervised calls. But you're also extremely paranoid that you're not gonna say um, what you're not supposed to say. Like I followed all all the rules to oh. a T with the phone calls. But yeah, all right. your letters, all your incoming and outcoming mail was read. And at one point, when I did get sick, and I wrote, home, I was telling my dad about it. Mm -hmm. and they took the letter and they said, you have to write a new letter. You're not allowed to tell them you're sick. Now, Emil was saying that he had to do like some outside chores. He would, he would take rocks, go one place to the other, yeah. bring them back just for absolutely no reason. Did the girls have to do that too? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'd say um, the physical punishments were the same, except I remember the boys would go out and mow the lawn and then have to repair the roof. And I don't think any girls had to do that, but yeah, work sanctions, um, work sanctions. Yes. Which I was on, I was on the work sanction for like the entire month of August leading up to my 18th birthday. And that's September. Cause they knew I was leaving. I already told myself, I'm not staying here. And, um, so yeah, they, t um, you'd fill up the buckets of rocks at one end of the driveway and you'd walk it. I'd say it was like a good one third of a mile. I drive it. You'd walk it all the way down and keep in mind, this is all, it was almost 100 degrees in August. And I had two buckets. I had a bucket in each hand, and then I'd fill them up like halfway. And like, no, you're lazy. Put more in. Put more in. I said, look, I'm my shoulder hurt. And then um, walk them down to the end of the driveway, dump them out, refill them, and walk them back. And that was like eight hours a day because I they're like I was not allowed to go to class anymore. And I also remember with that, I would just sing myself to. Because I love to sing, and they would um, you know, then they even took that away from like you're not allowed to sing while you're working. You are not even allowed to hum to yourself. And then um, I also remember the dead of January when I first got there. There was a girl carrying big blocks of cement up and down the driveway, but it was just a block of cement instead of bricks, and it was probably like 20 degrees outside in upstate New York with snow everywhere. And I think her mom had just been diagnosed with cancer, and oh. they considered her to be a brat. I'm still very good, very good friends with this girl, so I don't, I don't want to say too much of her business here. Right. Um, but at that point, a social worker was visiting that school, the school that day, because there were a, a, um, some in about um, suspicions of abuse. It was either a former alumni or someone in town, and um they pulled the girl aside to talk to her and she's like, no, I love it here. I love it here. I deserve this. Um, I deserve to carry this brick, this block of cement. Yeah. But it was a big, this was like a big, this was something you would uh, be at a construction site. And this girl was like five foot one size zero. Um, so it wasn't a cinder so, block. It wasn't a cinder yeah. block. It was, it was bigger. It, it was, a, it was like, uh, it was, 
as wide as I'm just saying my tablet. It's, it was probably like a little bit wider than that, but it was like a full like big blob. I mean, I'd say it was probably at least 30 pounds. You know, that's, that's a lot for a five foot one girl. Yeah, back and you know, other yeah. other work sanctions were like really ridiculous. Like you'd get a tiny little pair of like nose clipper scissors, and they said go out here and trim the entire soccer field. I I didn't have to do that, but I remember one girl went out with the little scissors, and she was had to go from one end of the soccer field like all day for days and days until like she had trimmed the whole field like one inch. I mean, it was just like insane. This stuff you you wouldn't even think about. I don't even think the, the military would be thinking up this no, shit. Um, no, they won't. With, or, or some were meant to humiliate you. Like they'd say, okay, you're a drug addict. You're going to die. So you, you, you're going to leave here and die. You're going to go out here and measure yourself. And you're going to dig a grave as wide and deep as it would take to hold you and then you're going to lay in it because that's what's going to happen to you when you leave. So I never had to dig my own grave but a lot of kids are out there digging their graves on um, a regular basis and there's actually a guy, an alumni he's in a very successful heavy metal band and he wrote a, a song and recorded a music video about that whole sanction uh -huh. And it's just really crazy. And then he's like, "Take your grave, take your grave," like in the song, like if you listen to metal. But um, I think that's kind of funny. Um, but that, yeah, that was a regular thing they did was um, grave digging. And then um, I had to go into the kitchen for like a week and scrub all the mold and mildew off the wall. Like it was nasty. I think it would have definitely failed a health inspection report for a professional restaurant. But I remember just like breathing in all that mold and mildew and I think it gave me health problems after I left. I remember just like inhaling it and just feeling so weak and sick and the guy he was like the head chef he would uh, the kitchen supervisor he came into the kitchen and he said yeah this is what you deserve because you said you're going to turn 18 and leave and um, this is what you get for abandoning us and, and he would have these, she would wear like a, bi a Bible shirt every day. Yeah, I just remember it so distinctly, the verse that says, I am the day he had. And he'd be like standing over, like screaming at me, watching me suffer and scrub this mold. And I remember I was so hungry because they'd restrict portions. And he left, he left like a leftover cake there from some kid's birthday. And I remember when he turned around, I was like shoving the cake in my mouth. <laughs> and, I, and then... He came back. He's like, why is there cake? There's cake over your face. You're stealing food. I said, no, nah, no, I'm not. The kid caught in the cookie jar. I said, no. Nah. And then, and I think he uh, felt some sort of empathy for me. And he like left. I was like, man, he's going to slam me. Um, but honestly, I had the icing all over my face. <laughs> um, but I, I was like, I was really, really desperate. Um, but he, he was a recovering alcoholic. You know, and I, um, you know, he just thought all of us were just alcoholics, and right. this is how you like treat treat people that um, to get them better. You were there. You were there yeah. when the uh, the alleged sex addict was there, right? Or sex offender? I oh yeah. So. so, so the choir director. He just seems to be a regular theme in everyone's story. So yes. he, uh, like I said, I was big into choir and band at home. So I like. He had several choirs at the school. He had like show choir, women's choir, mixed choir, church choir. I, I did. I was a choir lady, and he. Um, I was in all his musical theater productions, and um, very talented man, very talented. But he just was fixated on talking to us about sex, and especially masturbation. And he thought everything was just lust. Like even if you have like an honest, innocent crush or attracted attraction to someone at, at the school. It was just lust. And um, I remember he thought if you were singing off key, it meant you'd been masturbating. So, um, you know, the choir, he, he was conducting the choir one day, and I guess we sounded bad or off. He was like, someone's singing off key. And they make you go around the choir, like about 50 of us. And he was like, one by one, each sing the note he wanted. He's like, to, to, he's like, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. 
and I could tell everyone was shaking. And and then he said, um, because one of you is singing wrong, and that's the person that's been masturbating. You've probably been masturbating all week, and because of your selfish actions, that's why we're going to lose the the choir competition. That's why we're going to lose the choir competition. And um, you know, it was just constant. And he also, it's like he loved to just humiliate people. The guy, I don't think he had uh, was gender specific to his humiliation. Like he would pick on a guy. The like guy saw you looking at her. But he would tell the girl, one girl, um, she got into some kind of trouble in the choir. I don't know what she did. I can't remember. But I remember him stopping the whole choir. He's like, and that's why you're going to be a wet rag for men to come all over one day. And um, Jeez. just crazy. It'll be impulsive. Be like, he, it almost like he was like bipolar, he was like swinging on the pendulum because he'd be like really happy and telling us how wonderful. He's like, oh, I just love you guys. I just, I love you guys so much. And then he'd stop to like call someone, um, a wet rag. Um, no. And he would tell us how he told us all about his sex life with his wife and how they met. And um, then he had told us, well, before I met her, I was addicted to pornography and I would, I couldn't keep my eyes off the magazines at, in the checkout aisle at the grocery store, like the playboy or sports illustrated swimsuit edition. Uh -huh. And then he's like, in one day, he's like, I knew I had an addiction when I, I ordered a cheeseburger at the McDonald's drive through and I was jerking off, and I um, crashed my car into the, the sidewalk, leaving the parking lot, because I had the cheeseburger in my hand, and jerking off in the other hand, so I couldn't drive, and then he'd say, and then I'd go home and, like, lock myself in a closet with those dirty magazines, and just enjoy myself, but then he, he got his wife, and she worked at the school, and then he told us all, like, how, um, I think that's how he, the first time he did, like, real sex was with her. And um, I guess that solved a lot of his problems. Um, yeah. <laughs> but took, he would just... Took away he, some of the pressure. He talked yeah. about... <laughs> yeah, like, but he was just so fixated on everyone feeling like a whore. Now, he, was, he lived at Eastridge. Um, the Eastridge community, which is, is near, was near the family school. And it was just a community of adults. I think, like, I think kids lived there too. Just like an alternative community, like those intentional communities or hippie communes people live in now. But it was a commune based on the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, and we commit to sobriety and um, you take care of each other and you take care of the place. But I think a lot of them also would go into town and work jobs. But Paul, uh, he, okay. oh, I can say his first name. Yeah, the choir director. He. He lived. He he lived there, at that community. So um, I've talked to people that knew him when he was a child there, and they said he was just unruly brat. And um, I don't think he had a lot of friends. I don't think he ever went out out on a date. I think he had weird, awkward social skills. And then he. Um, finds the community he can live in the family school where he's getting paid to um kind of get revenge i don't know if it's like revenge of the nerds that's no that's that's a really bad example but i think i um it's like he got re he got revenge he got revenge on him like never having friends or never having a date he like took it out on all these teenagers that are they're kind of like blossoming into their I guess attraction to the opposite sex or attraction to the same sex, like whatever you're into. So he could just fully take it out on us. Right. You know, he's like, um, I know that word incel that keeps popping around. I don't know if pe pe people hear the word incel a lot. That's kind of what, how I see him as. And, um, but a very talented man. Um, but he, um, hmm. just, his whole character was based on sexual humiliation and he lived he his house he had his house and the basement was a dorm it was a first the boys it was a boys dorm and then later it became a girls dorm um you know but i don't he's not like officially on the sex offenders registry but i know i work in the public school system here and i know what would happen if any adult, any teachers spoke to the kids, 
spoke to the students like that. Oh yeah. You know, they, they, they'd be removed. They'd be removed. Oh yeah. You, you'd probably go to jail. There'd be news stories all over the place, but this man felt there. And you shouldn't even talk to your adult. Like if, even this was like an adult school or a college. You, you mean, if you have a position of authority, this is just not what you talk about. And, um, but you don't even talk yeah, to, you, you don't even talk um, to your kids that way. You know what I mean? No, you know, you don't, but nothing. I, I've seen a variety of people try to do something about him. I don't think any of any official charges have ever been made a, against him. Right. He was just kind of creepy. Basically he was creepy and he's just all about sex all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's uh, somebody to stay away from, even though they haven't been convicted or charged with anything. You know, it's best to just stay away from them because <laughs> you never know. You mm -hmm, might you true. might you might throw them off. You might push them off that edge. You know what I mean? That's true. Yeah. So so now you you were with a uh, organization called the Truth truth movement okay so there was it was called the family i was with two organizations there's the family foundation truth campaign and okay. cafeteria which was into the alliance for the ethical treatment of youth so yeah okay and um tell us about it the truth campaign the truth campaign was just basically a website i think it's maybe launched in 2008 um and it was just um, it kind of became a hot mess at the end, and then I, I know, like I listened to Emil ex explain it. He, he he couldn't have even explained it more perfectly with how it happened. But it was just um, the one of the guys who was running the website. Um, he was just collecting as many stories as possible and putting them on there. And then there was there was um, investigations that were were posted there. I told you about that. I have I have all the papers from that it was like a 1990 um like an actual legal investigation that was done on the school and he posted uh i don't i'm not sure how he got his hands on that it might have been free the, the foil freedom of information um after whatever that's called uh -huh. but he had those on there and um then he would post all these e it was like email exchanges between him and the staff I think he would, I think he, uh, he also go to convince, there was like family foundation school banquets in Manhattan where like the staff and like, I guess very wealthy donors would go to kind of promote the school. Um, he, he'd show, he, he was like always showing up at things like that and um, confronting people. I will say he was very bold, but he, a lot of his tactics as Emil explained were um, too ex extreme and it was like very, very, um, one-sided i felt like the whole campaign was becoming very one-sided and emil explained some of the exaggerations like the school was not a concentration camp i'm not gonna do like um mock situations that have been far worse for people like slavery on the plantations and these concentration camps um they started getting compared to that and I said well the only difference is we all knew we'd eventually leave the family school we, like the concentration camps and enslavement were literally like created to be like forever death you know what I mean camps. like you just death camps what it like death like when you were like you couldn't escape slavery and right. so um but yeah just like I felt like some of this yeah so I kind of got out of that campaign because um like with the the um, one of the guys who founded that campaign, so he was campaigning for like children's rights and the like, the rights of minors and teenagers. But one thing he was like, I think one thing that was brought up was um teenagers should never have a curfew, or like you shouldn't be allowed to have religious schools. I think if, if a parent wants to put their kid in a a healthy school that promote that is religious, like there are good institutions that are religious. There's decent schools, like boarding schools that promote religion and have prayer that don't starve kids and beat them and humiliate them and talk about sex all day. Um, I think I think minors do need restrictions and boundaries and, and curfews, but he just almost seemed like he was just so radical 
and you couldn't, it got to the point where you could not have a conversation with this guy. And Emil mentioned that mother who got involved. I know exact, exactly who she is. She got, she had sent her daughter there and then she got involved with the campaign and she was kind of the one pushing for all this radicalization. And then they were literally trying to get rid of the meal. I thought a meal was the most level headed person that, that, that it can explain everything about the school and the, the campaigns and every, everything that's happened. Um, probably the most level headed, brilliant person. Um, probably the greatest blessing that the alumni have ever had, but he just seems to be, um, a lot of people feel just, I'm going to use the word disgruntlement towards him. And that's why I just kind of dipped out of that campaign. But I went on, I stayed with Cap Cafferty eventually like just stopped. Cafferty was like a nonprofit. Uh, I did some public speaking with them and other alumni, including my friend, John Martin Crawford, who's the one who uh, went before Congress. But soon, it was after that, he killed himself in 2015. Yeah, um, I think Emil said something about that. Yeah. 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 But, I, um, yeah, the Cafferty kind of fizz fizzled out. And then, um, a film student, she was like a film student, human rights major. Like, she had a double major. She it decided, um, she wanted to do a documentary for her, like, thesis project on the family school. So she tracked four of us down on Facebook. And I was in that documentary. Um, I think that was 2012. Okay. Um, and then I've just kind of been asked if, like then, um, I mean, I would take long periodic breaks away from this stuff cause it just gets too crazy. But then all these, like the New York times wanted to get involved and I think they contacted me and I was like the first, one of the first people they interviewed and they've done at least like three or four stories, um, about us. So I did like, man, I was on the phone for like six hours with that guy who, um, <laughs> the story about us. Um, so, it, you know, it, keep, it keeps um, coming back. And then I remember, man, like two years ago, a couple of attorneys called me that were doing it. Someone had hired them to just interview people. And I guess somehow they got my name and I talked to them for a while. And then during COVID, I can't remember what it is. Like they lifted the, um, the time, what's it called? You lift the time constraint for reporting sexual abuse that happened to you as a minor. I can't remember what that Stat statute of limitations. Statute of limitations, yeah. So then it all like kind of came out. That happened during COVID. And then it's like people start contacting me again. They get like really excited. And then um, the program, that documentary just came, like Hell Camp. And the and the program both came out on Netflix talking about these schools and then and then again people start I'll get like a bunch of texts on Facebook they're like oh have you seen this Grace have you seen this so it, it keep it keeps coming back to my life um, you know I I kind of let it just come and go now I take long breaks but I think this is going to be a part of my life for like until I I die like. Um, helping people process it and helping uh, bring the necessary change. So this doesn't uh, keep happening. Cause I know these schools, there's a lot of them are still a lot meant like a lot of the rugs getting pulled out from under the industry and it's a lot of exposure, but there's still um, schools operating like this, even though right. a lot of the big ones that shut down like diamond rants, Provo, um, the Ivy, what's it? Ivy Ridge or Ivy Creek, whatever the, that one on yep. Netflix, Elon, Elon school was one I worked hard on that I wanted to get closed. There's like Elon. I think there's one out. Or I think Elon's in Maine. And then there's Bachelor Academy or something like that in Oregon or Washington. I think Tranquility Bay in yes. Jamaica got closed down. And the, the one, there's one on the island of Samoa, Paradise Cove, which that one, what these people do, it's so sneaky. They take, they operate an American school, school, Mm -hmm. And other countries where there's less restriction on ch um, like child labor laws and the rights of minors. And then they can just do whatever they want. And plus, when you're on an island in the middle of nowhere, what are you going to do? If you run away, like, what do you do? You can't, you can't swim, swim back home. Yeah. But I know in Jamaica, 
those kids, I think they had a mass runaway and like, I think the entire school like ran away into the jungle and like the feds or whatever you call it in Jamaica, the, the military operation, like chasing them. And a lot of the parents in America didn't know where their kid was. And then I think it got, um, I think some of the locals were taking kids in, in the jungle, like taking them into their house. And uh, kind of then I think yeah. it got shut down. But the family school kept telling us about Samoa. I didn't believe them. I said, that, I said, that school doesn't exist. Paradise Cove doesn't exist. And they said, if you don't get it together here, you're going to get sent there. They would say it to all of us. And they're like, you can't leave till you're 21. You sleep on the floor and you wear grass skirts. And um, it was when I left and I did research. I was like, wow, that place really exists. Really exists, uh, I, but mm -hmm. uh, I, now I know that uh, I think Tranquility Bay is is closed. Uh, I'm the one in Jamaica. Tranquility Bay is closed. Yes, Paradise mm -hmm. Cove. I, I haven't heard of that one, but um, that's the, that's on the that's the one on the island of Samoa. Samoa. You know what? I looked it up today, uh -huh. and I think they changed. They change the name. That's another sneaky thing they do. They'll like just change. They'll shut a place down and change the name of the place or the staff. They'll send the staff to work in other um, s similar schools. They sure. keep like cycling people yeah. around. That's what they do. They'll 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 go uh, if it's in the United States. They'll go if they close the school down. They'll go to another state that doesn't have mm -hmm. restrictions and set up camp over there. And have you noticed? Like I tell everybody else. All the all these places are located in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by woods and Utah, surrounded by yeah. rivers or lakes. We're, we're 20, 30 miles from the nearest town. That's what they told us was that a bear or a mountain lion would get us up there. And I remember I wanted to get the hell out of there so bad. And see, my dad was a wilderness survivalist. He taught me so much. And I was even plotting in my head. I was like, how can I live out here in the woods till I turn 18? Let's see. It's seven months until I turn 18. What berries and roots do I know that I could eat? And I, I can like camouflage my scent. And um, I was like, hide over here. I'll build something and I'll, I'll have to have a weapon. And I was like literally planning this whole like, was like Lord of the Flies or um, kind of, I'm trying to think of a better, um, one of those survival shows i can't remember but i was just trying to think how i would manage myself and that was like a real thought in my head they also told i think there was a shooting range down the road and they said you will get shot like they're out there work practicing their guns all night they said you um you you will get shot if you leave and another big one was like they one of them staff told us that there's like um rapists in town looking for um family school girls like if you run away like they know and you could probably get raped in town and i said well if you know there's someone raping in town or like trying to have sex with minors well i guess yeah minors. some of us like would turn 18 and leave and they, they'd all they they use that threat against us so i said well if you know there's like someone like that doing that in town why don't you report him to the police to the police yeah just which now like they're obviously full of shit i don't think there were so many town members that would help kids run away. They're like, oh, I'll buy you the bus ticket back to Manhattan. Yeah, one guy, ran, kid ran away and he stayed with some elderly lady for a month and like worked on her yard. And, um, I mean, I think a lot of people in that town hated the school. Now, a lot of them were very angry when it shut down. Like, I've had town members from there recognize me and confront me when I've been going through. But at the same time, a lot of them hate, hated the school. Yeah, I'm sure they knew that there was abuse going on over there mm -hmm. from, from the amount of runaways that were that were showing up in their town. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I mean to have a just a couple of kids run away that's one thing, but when you got you know dozens of kids throughout the years, maybe hundreds of kids throughout the years running away, it's a pattern. You know, there was at least one runaway a week. Run, run and some of them would leave in the dead of winter. Without their shoes, because they you'd be on a no shoes no shoe sanction, because they they thought you were gonna run away, so you wouldn't have access to your shoes. But I remember one girl, just she just took off like she was in the dorm, and I turned my head and I turned around, she was gone. Like I've never seen someone run so fast, 
and their bare feet. And this hill was like really steep. You had to run down and it was, it was February and she, she took off. She was gone for like four months. And until they found her and brought her back, we knew that she was in a local jail. And I remember, I don't know what she'd been picked up for. She was only 14, but she gave the jail people a wrong name. She didn't have an ID on her, but they, um, she refused to say her real name. And I think there'd been like um, pictures of her posted, like a missing persons report. So the jail, I guess they knew the family school, but they called and our family leader went down and picked her up. And she was still, I don't know him. And, and she was like giving him the wrong name. And he kept saying, no, I know who this is. So she was released back into his care and brought back to the school. But I mean, these runaway stunts were really crazy. Yeah, but um, some guy, I think one guy made it all the way to California, and they still brought him back. Now a lot of them um, weren't brought back, or they would they would make it home, and their parent would be like, "Wow, I really do believe you. I won't make you go back." But then some of the parents drove the kid back to the school, and so the worst thing that could happen to you was like your runaway attempt fails, and you have to come back and start all over again as if you're a new student. You have no shoes. You have no like special food privileges, no movie privileges. You just sit in the corner facing the wall. And yeah, your shoes, you can't have your shoes. You can't talk to anyone. Wow. And it's really like all the progress you made to get closer to your uh, departure date is, is gone. So that is something you had to weigh that. Uh, it's like a gamble when you're trying to weigh it. You're like, your plan really needs to work. Yeah, or else you're starting at starting at zero again, pretty much. Or some would just get sent to the wilderness program, like a, um, a wilderness program out in Utah or somewhere, um, which is usually like six weeks long, where you're um, you'd like go do the wilderness program and then come back to the family school. And um, I'm sure you're familiar with the wilderness program, so you're just out like hiking all day, carrying right. a big heavy backpack. And I had somebody on for know, that, yeah, for a wilderness mm -hmm. program. I think the guy he went to Seuss. Um, he was maybe I can't remember how long ago he was on the show, but he went to the suit. He went to the one in North Carolina, the Seuss program. Right. There's also another one in uh, the mountains up by uh, the west, somewhere up there by. Uh, Maybe maybe Seattle, maybe uh, North Dakota. I don't know. It's one of those areas there where they had some sort of wilderness camp for troubled teens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're they're they're. But all, a lot. Of... Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I was just saying. Like, there's been numerous deaths at these. I don't know if you're. Um, I think Bright Star North Star was the name of the place where Aaron Bacon died, and that was in the late nineties. But his story is probably the most famous uh, wilderness, uh, wilderness camp death. And that someone made a movie about him. But he, this guy, he had detailed diary notes he, he took that his mother was able to read. Where he said he had so much pain in his stomach. And they kept calling him a liar and a manipulator. But apparently he had internal bleeding. And he'd lost like 20 pounds. He was a 16-year-old boy. And he'd lost so much weight, he was like emaciated, and he had the internal bleed. I don't know if it was his spleen or what ruptured. And, um, you know, his case is his parents have gone to extensive efforts to hold those people accountable. I don't know if they ever were, like, arrested. I think some of them went on to start, well, those staff went on to work at um, other programs, from my understanding. I have to go back and, like, see what became, I mean, obviously that was, like, 1996, so it's been a long time right but the big thing at the family school was the the medical neglect like um that was a big theme there and no and no, an no dentist no dentist either right i went to the dentist a couple of times to get her <laughs> to get a retainer um but yeah it was it was bit it was minimal and i remember like the dentist said that like one of my teeth up there looked like it was growing the wrong way. And um, he said I should get it removed. And I remember the school said, well, the, 
the anesthesia is going to make her feel like she's high and we can't have that. So that, that never happened. <laughs> oh, these but people. Oh, they're, they first, within two weeks of me arriving there, I broke out in shingles. Oh, and shingles, I guess it's, it's related to the nervous system. Like you can have, um, I guess you only get shingles once in your life, but, um, uh, a nerve it, it can get triggered by extreme stress so i remember it broke out and it was all the way down my side like all the way my arm like i couldn't i had to like keep my arm like lifted up because it was so painful to have this like part of the on the other side and it was just like already all the way down my side and like stomach i still have the scars and so painful and they're just like looking at me like I'm crazy I'm like complaining about this and they're um they had a doctor who would visit the school and um I guess he gave me some cream to rub on it but I, I was like you don't understand like it, this is painful to wear clothes and they're like no just keep the cream on. and it was like I still had to do all my day to day procedures and um go about like business as normal but it was just like every move I made was so painful because those and the the, the herb it was like um the little body boils postules you get they were like bursting on my skin and bleeding yeah. bleeding it's, it's and um it's like so a I, was, I was always like stop complaining yeah but everything was always like stop complaining and then i remember after being there for like a year i remember i got like a really bad case of food poisoning like, I woke up in the middle of the night in, like, just extreme pain. I, like, sat up. I was, like, trying to make my way to the bathroom, and I just couldn't. I, like, threw up all of my that came out, and I, it was, like, it, this was really gross. It was, like, explosive diarrhea. I could not control it. Went all over the bed. I made it to the bathroom, and it, I, try, I just jumped into the bathtub, and it, it just, everything went everywhere. It was just so disgusting, and it just wouldn't stop. I was, like, I'm dying. I'm dying. The yes. girls woke up, and they're like, oh, holy shit. And one of them just started cleaning the bathroom, like, cleaning up after me. And then, like, they're like, just go back to bed. And then in the morning, they, like, took me to the nurse. And I remember my family leader, the, the father, he came in, and he was like, are you, are you for real? Like, you're not making this up. You're not faking this. I said, how, how is that possible? That's not like pretty good acting. You yeah. want to go up and look at my bed? And you want to tell me that how, how could I pull something off like that? And um, they let me like lay down for like a day and a half. And then they're like, oh, you got to get back to work. Uh, all my chores, all the responsibility. They gave us so many responsibilities. You were literally on your feet doing something. It went out on your feet. Like you mean either it was academics or being busy with something or physical labor 18 hours a day. There was never a moment to just like reset and relax, get back to homeostasis. And um, I had to go back to that that regimen so fast after that that episode, and they never brought me a, a doctor. But then um, my bed was covered in all my bodily elements, and by then it had kind of dried up. And I told them I need a new mattress and I need a new comforter. They let me like wash my sheets, but they're like, "Oh, we can't give you a new mattress, and the washing machine's not big enough for your blanket." And I'd already had the mindset on leaving when I was 18, but I still had at least like six months by then. So I said, for the rest of my stay, I slept in that and my dried shit and vomit for at least six mm -hmm. months. And what that does to your psyche and your, your self-worth, when I told the adult staff and my family about that, and they're like, what makes you think you deserve new, like, clean bedding like what do you want us to do about it you shouldn't have thrown up all over the place <laughs> and so um to me that's one of the, the darkest memories just yeah. i don't even know if a prisoner would be treated like that no he'd be taken to the infirmary right away i mean he'd be given a clean bed they probably would not make yep. him like sleep in his vomit and shit for no. six months no they would they would put him in a different cell what they would do. Oh, okay. Yeah, they give give them a different cell, different mattress. 
You know, they they have him take a shower. You know, put all his other stuff in the in the uh, laundry. Yeah, the prisoners were, treat, oh, okay. were treated better than than uh, you guys were. So, well, I've heard people, a couple of guys that come on here and said they like hoping they'd get sent to a psych ward or, or jail or something. I hope I can get kicked out of here. Just put put me in jail. Um, several like um, unfortunately, a lot a lot of alumni have been in jail and prison um post family school um it seems to be a, a consistent theme with our group unfortunately but um some have said man i would take prison over the family school any day, any day. Yeah. like they're like prison was a walk in the park compared to the family school because at least in prison you can own your own mind like and you're allowed to ignore people if you want right so yeah you know. there's a lot more rights in prison Mm -hmm. so. yeah anyway grace it's been great thanks for coming and sh sharing oh, your you. story appreciate it mm -hmm. and uh oh no thank you so much um so i'm gonna go ahead and i'm gonna end the show uh stay on the line okay mm -hmm. uh, let me do it real quick okay I want to thank everybody for watching. I want to thank Grace especially for coming on again uh, and uh, telling her story and uh, kind of giving us an uh, insight uh, view on this Family Foundation. Now, the Family Foundation school is closed, thank goodness, so we don't have to worry about that. But we have people that were there that are still going through the struggles mentally, physically. So hopefully uh, we wish them the best. Uh, so uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel that we can get the notification when this uh, video comes up. So for the Hammer Podcast, I'm Jason. You take care of yourself, take care of each other, and we will see you in the next podcast. All right.